Hello, welcome to the February 6th, 2024 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream today. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de or simply ask questions in the live chat field. When asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase you're running, so if it's uh, Cubase version 11, 12, or 13, also, if you could specify which level of Cubase, whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Element, Artist, or Pro, and which operating system, that information is helpful. When asking questions, if you don't get an immediate response to your question, if we could avoid asking and repeating the same questions over and over again, that would just allow us to get through more questions in a more timely manner. So I'd appreciate that. So if you don't see an immediate response, we will go through all the questions chronologically as asked. Um, uh, we should have an index of all topics that are covered in today's live stream pinned to the top of the comments field several hours after the live stream ends. So if you don't see an immediate, um, so look for that. I'll take a dinner break after the live stream ends and then we'll go through it. And that way you could quickly navigate and find, search for the topic um, and if you and go immediately to that particular moment in time in the video, if you want to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, I think we're over 31,000 live streams currently. You can go to cubaseindex.com, and we want to thank Jan from Stockholm for creating that website where you could search for uh, search for topics and immediately look and find them and be taken to that moment in a live stream. We also want to give special thanks to Agent K and Jazz Dude, who serve as moderators for the live stream. And we'll give a special kudos to Jazz Dude for his work on the Cubase Nation Discord as well. Uh, so once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America. I primarily focus on Steinberg products, and I'm the host today. I'm presenting from outside Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. And if you're watching this live, um, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. So I saw one question that fell off the chat that was submitted a few hours before. Let me find that. And the first question will be... Uh, Damien here from Western Australia. I've exported my ADM 5.1 Dolby file and brought it into another 5.1 track. I'm looking to have more control now over the six channels. Is there a way to separate them? So generally when you're working, with, if you've exported an ADM file, um, first thing is like Cubase doesn't import ADM files, but it will export them. If you wanted to import files, you could do it as, uh, you could use Nuendo will allow you to import ADM files. But if it's just a, I'm not sure if it's ADM specifically, because a 5.1 will be kind of, you know, fixed to particular speakers where an ADM file will be object oriented, where a file could be moved to different sets of speakers, uh, depending upon the playback scheme. But if we have a, if we wanted to import a 5.1 interlead file, I think I have one here. I'll select this. And now that we <clears throat> have imported the file, we can see that we have all of our files our interlead file directly here for us. So we see left, right, center, LFE, and left, right, surround. And this is all as one file. So if we wanted to split that, one way to do it is on import. There's a preference. So if we go to preferences and we go to editing to audio, and we can say on import audio files, you could choose to split channels. And as you do that, it would automatically split the 5.1 interlude file into multiple tracks. Or if we go to your project menu and we go to convert tracks, we'll say, so as we select this, you could just say, it's a project to convert tracks. 
and you could choose multi-channel to mono. So you could then just simply export and that will split it up. But try just going directly to your preferences. So if I have this automatically set to split channels, I'll delete this particular audio file from the project window and we'll import the audio file again. And we'll put these two, we'll select different tracks. And now each audio file is, each channel has been put onto its own individual track like that. All right, so our next question. Uh, when will Cubase support 4K video export? Um, so currently most you know, of our composers still are getting 1080p video files to compose to as opposed to 4K. So if we come over here, so it's gonna, the codec that's included for the export video. So if we come over here, we can choose export video it will be a 1080p resolution. There is a new function. I haven't tried this with the 4K video, uh, but a, instead of exporting in Cubase 13, there's a replace audio and video. And this will take this, I believe, I, I haven't tested this, but this will basically replace the audio file into the existing video. So that may do it at 4K. Again, I haven't tested to see if that works, but you could give that a try instead of exporting the, the video but just to replace the audio in the video file and that way it's not recreating a video a new video file it's just basically uh, copying the same resolution of the video and and including the audio mix down with that wonderful to see daniela tokan on and great to see jazz dude we see benny from sweden we see jan from cubase index in stockholm alexander plasco from connecticut if memory serves all right, we see uh, the artist known as Love from New York wants everyone to hit the like button. We see Soren from Sweden. Thanks for being on. John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. We have uh, Gary Strauss is running Cubase 13 on i7 PC with 16 gigs of RAM. Okay, question from Dallas LaRue. Can you show a way of making an arpeggio out of a chord using T guitar? All right, so see if I think I have T guitar installed. Okay, so we'll load up T guitar. Okay, so when we come over to T guitar, we could just choose patterns. So we could put on kind of individual. So I could hold a guitar chord, like where the white keys. Then I could, so I could have kind of up. Now, if we switch this from our mode to patterns at this point, we could choose our different patterns. So now I could, as we would play chords. And you could choose different patterns for different keys. So as we come over here. Then 
as I would play different chords, d different keys in the the pinkish color here. At that point, we could just have different patterns. Let's say, okay, I want a pop pattern now. So this way it's actually just, I'm not sure if it's actually triggering a particular, uh, the notes individually, but I think what it's actually doing is it's triggering those performances of the different scales. So once you, in T guitar, just come over here, you could switch from solo, where you can play individual notes, chords, and then patterns. And then you could just kind of right click or just click on the particular key and then you could choose different patterns directly there. So let's say we want more of a folk pattern. So that way you could just kind of choose your different patterns as you come along there. All right, next question. Okay, so we have uh, Samuel checking in from Lagos, Nigeria. Thanks for joining us today. We have Uno Memento we see from Finland. All right, uh, Val from Vienna asks, how can I route audio into a VST instrument to try to route audio into Serum VST3? Uh, so not all instruments do this, but uh, let's go ahead and we'll just open up an instance of... Um, like Retrolog can do this, uh, Halion can do this as well. So I'll just come over here and we just would utilize the sidechain function. So what we would do at this point is activate the sidechain in the VST instrument. So we're going to activate the sidechain and then we choose a source to feed into the sidechain. And at this point, when we do this, we'll see like an input. And this is where the, the audio track is being routed into the instrument via a side chain. And that's how you, you route audio into the instrument. So see if, if you have, once you open up Serum, uh, I don't have a license of it, but if you have the side chain capability, but this is how most instruments would route audio as an input. And if you wanted to do sampling inside of inside of an instrument, such as the full version of Groove Agent, the full version of Howling in 7, that's how you would route it to do sampling, just by enabling the side chain within the instrument. All right, uh, Alessandro Brass. Braz asks, uh, how do I set the number of backups Cubase creates and the frequency of the backups created? And how do I set the backup files to be automatically saved into a backups folder? So it's going to be saved at the same level of the project level. And it's going to be a .bak file. So unfortunately, it's not pl automatically placed into a folder. But if you go to your preferences and go to general, at this point, you could set the maximum number of backup files and the frequency of the autosave. So by default, it'll be 10 minutes and 10 backup files, and you could just activate autosave right here. So go to your preferences or settings, and then to general, and then make sure that autosave is on by default, and this is where you set the interval and the quantity of backups. See, Val is just glad he made it to the stream today. So glad you can make it as well. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have Mark Rabin checking in from Montana. We'll give a big woof to his dog, Stella. Glad you can make it today, Mark. Thanks for being a part of the community. All 
All right, so we see a question from Mark R. Uh, using Cubase 13, using MIDI editor, and viewing MIDI for more than one instrument. How do I prevent the view from going back to the beginning of the track when I deselect an instrument? All right, so let's take a look at it. You open up something that's, that's lots of MIDI. All right, so we have lots of different MIDI events going on here. I'll just look at my violin and see if I'm reading this right. Okay, so how do I prevent the view? Okay. Okay, and let's say we're viewing more than one instrument. So let's say I'll look at my violin and oboe. Okay, and um, how do I prevent a view from going back to the beginning of the track when I deselect an instrument? So let's say I have this part here, and I'm going to deselect uh, my oboe. So deselecting doesn't seem to move the play play position of the cursor. Um, I wonder, it might also tie into, see if you have this, this if you go to transport, if you have uh, video follows edit mode on. So let's say if I have this selected, now when I select this and I deselect it, it looks like it stays the same, but this, that particular mode here in the transport will automatically move the playhead to the beginning of a selected event. So see if maybe that is, so when I come here, we see that the playhead is consistent with any selected event. It's not moved, but when this mode is turned on, the use video falls edit mode, then the, the playhead moves to the beginning of the selected event. So see if that's doing it or if I'm doing it differently than you are but it seems like the um seems like the view is consistent as well not jumping back to the beginning so let's say if i zoom in here and let's say if i select this event we still have a lot of data at the beginning so let me know if if i'm doing it differently than you are and let me know if, if you know if I'm misunderstanding as well, Mark. Uh, so we see, hi Greg, my name is Michael. My question is, if you do tutorials on Cubase, Cubasis on iOS, so generally all my tutorials have been kind of on desktop computers. So I haven't done any on Cubasis. Um, it's kind of hard in the middle of a live stream to switch back and forth between uh, a tablet and and a computer so uh, I'm not against doing any Cubasis tutorials I think it's great um, but let me know but I haven't done any on Cubasis but there are some available and I think it's different tools for capturing the video display than what I have All right, so we see Jay from Secret Studios uh, says, thanks for your help. Would you be so kind to share whether there is a way to make sends to effects happen post-fader, but to instruments be pre-fader by default? Okay, so I don't know a way to do that. So, um, so let's say if we have, we jump back. to our other project here. And let me just look for a preference because I think we could set a default level.
So we can set our sends to default to level, but I don't think we could set whether it's going to be pre or post fader. Um, let's take a look and see if we add an effects channel track. So when we do this, it's going to be not set for pre or post fader. So I'll come over here. So I think that you might have to just go to the particular track itself. And let's say if we see our sends here to at this point choose whether you want it to be pre-fader or post-fader, but let's see if we have this set as a project logical editor. to see if we set this to transform, if we could yeah, so we could um, I don't see a way to kind of automate pre-fader, post-fader I think that that would have to be done kind of automatic by that would have to be done manually so I don't know a way to set it by default for instruments and audio to be set differently. Uh, so you might have to just simply, you know, add that by, uh, as you see, you know, manually as needed. Sorry about that. All right, Daniello Tokan asks, hello, Germany. Uh, hello from Germany. Hello, Greg. I did search out to find the editor in Media Bay. It took me uh, alone hours of work and how, how exact to rate sounds. I mean, an editor where and how to tag sounds with the UCS. So if we're in Media Bay, let's come over here. If you wanted to uh, rate, you know, set ratings for particular sounds. So we'll come over here to, let's say, our VST sounds. Um, all you have to do is just directly in the ed so it's not necessarily uh, an editor per se, but you know from the main media bay menu, you could just adjust the amount of stars just by clicking and going through and saying this is a one star sound, two star, five star sound, just like that. Also, if you have kind of the right zone active. Once you have the object selected here, you could change the sounds here, and that would automatically change the ratings in, that we see in Media Bay. So you can make these changes directly here without having to go to an editor. But if you go to the right zone, and here you could even add your own editor, what functions are available in the editor. So you could do it directly from there. So let me know if that makes sense for you. All right, so we see uh, so an editor where and how to tag sounds with, uh, I guess, maybe if I misunderstand, with the UCS, Universal Sound Categorization System, that is better, like SoundMiner. So, you know, unfortunately, with all metadata, there is no universal standard, which is why we kind of came up with one because there isn't one. There's about 15 different uh, proposals for standards. So. All right, Alessandro Braz asks, uh, when I select a section of an audio clip in the sampler track, I notice the selection area turns orange. Is there a reason for this? I use Cubase 10.5. All right, so let's Go ahead to my sampler control, I'll drop just a sample in. All right, so it says, so 
So when you select a section, audio clip and sample track, and this is selection area turns orange. All right, so let me see if this is just based on the color of the particular track here. So it looks like maybe just the, so if it's like the color of the waveform, it looks like maybe it's just the color of the track itself right here. So you can just change the color there from like orange, which is where I had it by default as my first color, but you could just change the track color and that will follow, the waveform will follow the track color. All right, so we see from uh, Daniela Tokan, uh, Media Bay is useless for film scoring and sound design if I cannot meta tag. No info on how to do it. I just found out after hours how to rate. So as we saw before, I think the rating is pretty simple just to come over here. But if you want it to take a number of samples, so we'll come over to, let's say, this computer, documents. And I wanted to find a particular, I'll go to projects, we'll open up this particular folder. Okay, so when I select these files here, so let's say I only want to see um, audio files in this folder. So now we can see all of the audio files. And if I, again, just, Come over here, enable the right zone. Then you could just place, you know, so if I want to uh, add a tag here. So again, I will click and we'll say, let's just add a tag for album. So whatever you want it to be. So now we'll see our album category. I have all of these. And I'll just call this album Fred Drummer Boy. And hit enter. So now when we want to select any of these files and we look at album, we could just have that meta tag information right there. So make sure that A, you have the right side open and then you can just simply add your tags and you could do it for multiple files at once. All right, Daniel Pashman asks, how can you copy sidechain inputs when copying a plugin over with sidechain input to another track? Okay. All right, so let's say I want, so I think that it's still going to, so let's say we have our sub kick and I want that as a side chain for this, for a compressor. So open up my black valve, activate the side chain. So let's say we'll move this here. And now when I copy, all right, and let me just look at the side chain source here. All right, so I'm gonna add a side chain source and we'll say it's coming from the sub kick. I'll get rid of this. So I hold down my Alt or Option key, copy, double click. Um, so the, the source isn't copied because there's always the possibility um, and there's I could understand why you may want it, but there's also the possibility that you could copy it to a track where it's a sidechain input and create a feedback loop. So I, you know, so I understand where it could be convenient uh, but it could also create uh, problems for different routing options and creating feedback loops if it was automatically routed. 
So I kind of understand the philosophy on why it's wanted, but why it's, you know, not on by default, but I'll pass it along as a suggestion regardless. Daniel? Sorry, my chat field just jumped. All right, uh, Bling Bling asks, Hi Greg, I want to use the Project Logical Editor to select all the presets of a VST that I like and save them as presets in the media bay while also copying the original name. Uh, so I don't know of a way to do that with the project logical editor, but you know, probably the fastest way to do that again is using kind of the rating system. So let's say if we are coming here to VST sound, so you don't have to create two different areas. So let's say I want to go to FM lab. And as I go through these particular presets, you know, just use five stars, say five stars. And then at this point you could choose, you know, the different, you could say, I want to find only uh, presets that I like that have four stars or higher. And then you could just come over here and just do your ratings that way. So I don't know of a way to kind of copy over all of you know, your favorite presets, but I think that this is kind of an appropriate way. So let's say if I want to come over and again, I'm looking for everything that has one star. I'm looking for everything that has five stars that you could go through very quickly and just do your media bay ratings just like that. And now that way you could easily customize things without having to save multiple presets of the same files. We have a question from Norby. Any rumors on CC121 controller replacement? I don't want to go down the soft tube slash SSL controller route. Would much rather prefer to just use the stock channel strip instead of loading their respective plugins. So nothing that no plans have been, nothing has been announced for CC121. Um, and I'm sure that if, you know, if there was something immediately on the horizon that, you know, we may be able to kind of share the information, but currently there's no Yamaha produced replacement for the CC121. It's been announced. All right, so we see from Quellen, uh, hey Greg, how can I chop mini, I guess MIDI notes like the chopper in DL Studio? I would like to use it by doing hat rolls by chopping MIDI. So I'm not familiar with it, uh, but if we have, you know, long notes here, So let's say I have one long note and if you hold down just the, there's a couple of different methods, but if you hold down, so if we split with the pencil tool, uh, we could just kind of come over there. And so let's say I want to split, I'll just turn off snap here. So if I split with the pencil tool, we can make notes just like that but if it's kind of like for hi-hats one thing you could do is if you hold down the alt or option key and whatever rhythmic interval that you cut from the very first time with while holding down the alt or option key can now just automatically chop particular notes you can take one particular note and just chop it so check try holding down the alt or option key on an existing long note and click with the scissors tool and that will make multiple cuts of your MIDI. So let me know if that's helpful. There are also some other methods where you could use the range selection tool 
to move the range and cut like you know entire if you have cords and stuff like that as well but let me know if that's helpful for you Quellen. all right so we have a uh, samog engineer mixing and mastering glad to see you back on says you just got to msp 3a uh he seems to love the monitors it's great All right, so we have uh, Perti Komenin from Finland. Thanks for joining us. All right, Quellen asked, uh, hey, Greg, is it possible to save automation curves as presets in combination with the plugin? You know, so generally automation and the plugin parameters are going to be uh, independent of each other. There are some examples where if we go into the sampler track, so let me just come over here. Let's say we have something in the sampler track where we could go into different uh, envelope shapes. So if you want it to come over and let's say let's paint in this envelope shape. And that's kind of part of the particular uh, preset for the plugin. So you could do stuff like that because it's part of the plugin and it's not kind of a separate, separate function like we get with some other uh, tools that automation isn't necessarily tied to a particular plugin. One of the other plugins where you could do something similar to this might be if we go into the inserts under modulation and if you go into the effects modulator here we could have different curves that could be utilized as well and these could be saved as part of the preset as part of the preset for the plugin but it's not where the automation is going to be you know, it's kind of a separate entity from the plugin, so it's not going to be stored. But you could save that as if you exported selected tracks. So if you had automation on it, you could import those into other projects and have the automation, uh, the curves retained with that. But you know, generally by default, the plugin preset itself, you know, doesn't isn't aware of what ex what is going on externally in terms of automation. All right, uh, Mark Rabin asks, I have a question slash request i'm trying to find a way to use a keystroke or midi remote to select and load strip presets so maybe uh, a button to next previous or assign base strip to key combo all right so let's say if we have we just add some fake audio tracks here So I'm just gonna go to my media bay. Let's jump home to presets and we'll say track presets audio. Okay. So I think if I, so if you just double click, it's gonna load the preset. So, you know, using your up and down arrow keys, you could select those particular presets and well, it's not a key command to do it. You can just drag over the particular presets onto the track or as you're adding tracks, like if you're scrolling through track presets here, you could double click and that will automatically add the track with that particular track preset. Or if you just drag the track preset over, um, so let me know if that would work for you, Mark, but I'll pass along, you know, so you can use a MIDI remote or just your keyboard to audition, 
you know, to scroll through your different track presets. And then, you know, just drag it right to the particular track. So let me know if that workflow would make sense for you. All right. Okay, so we see from, uh, I guess, Oslet147. Hi, Greg. I have a question about Logical Editor. I've used a tool often to create random drum fill patterns between certain notes. Uh, I would like to ask that is there a way to set a random pitch values for specific notes, i.e. notes D1, A1, B1, and excluding everything else, uh, how their filtering logic should be done, and what kind of scenario since the notes are not adjacent. Thanks. All right, so let's take a look. So let's say I come over here. All right, so let's say I have kick snare. All right, and let's say D1, A1, B1. So let's say I'll put in some hi-hats. So we don't want these to be affected. And let's say, okay, we want, or I guess we want D1 to be affected, uh, A1 and B1. So let me just draw in some notes. And A1. Okay, so we want to kind of randomize the pitch on uh, B1, D1, and A1. Okay, so let's set this up. So let's say, let's get to our MIDI to logical editor to set up. And we want to transform. And we're going to say type is equal to note. It's going to be, we'll say pitch. So we're going to choose subtype. All right, and we're going to choose is equal to D1, A1, or B1. All right, and in this case, we want to change our Boolean conditions. So we want to change notes that are equal to D1 or A1 or B1. And so we don't want it to be and because we probably won't have condition where all those notes are selected. So at this point, we want to uh, set random values. And we could choose between C1 and C2. Okay. Okay, so we can see B1, A1, D1. So now we should be able to just randomize the pitch only on those where our hi-hats and kicks remain the same. So try setting it up like this. So transform type is equal to note. You want to choose the subtype, which will give you pitch is equal to D1 or A1 or B1, and then you could set to random values for fills. So let me know if that works for you. All right, uh, Steve Green asks, uh, Greg, Spectral Layers 10 is standalone, edited track, drag and drop into an open project, no longer hear the playback. 
In a project, I have to close the application reopen. The release driver is ticked. Okay. Um, so first off, I you know let's see if we open up spectral layers. So we have audio here as we as I've destroyed my song. All right, so we have audio going here. I'm going to go to spectral layers. You find I always run it as a ARA extension, but I'll just come over here. All right, I'm going to check the audio output here. So that's playing. So it seems like it's kind of working as expected here. Um, but, you know, most people, I'm not sure if you're running it standalone as a for a particular reason. Uh, but one thing you can also do is run it if you're not familiar as an ARA extension. So if you come over here, you could just choose, let's open it in spectral layers. And now when you double click, Say so let's run as spectral layers now. Double click and it will just show up uh, and basically replace the sample editor with spectral layers. So, but that dragging and dropping seemed to work for me on that. Let me know if I did it differently than you. And just to show you what my settings are for the release driver. Um, I don't have that even checked and just kind of worked both ways. All right, so we see Mark Rabian, uh's question on the logical editor continued, or I guess on the... Um, the track presets it says basically I want to select preference for my bass or guitar cab on button push for input channel so I could quickly set up set my input channel for the correct source you know so one of the things that you could do also is you know, like as you go to add a track is you know once you're adding your track here you can set you know all of your inputs and outputs directly from here before the track is added so let me know if that is if that could speed up your process as well, Mark. But that's generally where I kind of do my routing for tracks as well. But you could also just say right click, load track preset. And once you come over here, just double click. And then you could just add the tracks based on the track preset that you just made. All right, so we see a question. Hi, Greg, I want to save a MIDI file containing multiple MIDI channels, bass, drums, piano, etc., into a single track and be able to save it as a MIDI loop in, uh, in the media bay. All right, so MIDI files and MIDI loops are two different 
aspects. So if we have a MIDI loop, so a MIDI loop will, you know, contain a lot of the information. So let's say, so when I go to export it as a MIDI loop, so, you know, a MIDI loop is going to contain all of the information that is needed, such as the contents of this particular loop, and it can will contain what actual instrument is playing it back. So a MIDI file is just kind of the actual notes. A MIDI file is basically when we envision it would just be a list of all of the note on, note off messages. It doesn't have any information as to what particular sound is played. We don't have any particular information. Uh, there could be a program change, but a program change for one instrument will often not be aligned to a program change for another instrument, unless you're specifically using General MIDI, GS, or XG, uh, those particular protocols. So MIDI loop will be for a single event so that when you import it, those particular notes and that particular instrument that sounds those notes correctly will be imported. A MIDI file, if we if you have multiple channels, we could export your MIDI file and there's some preference settings that we do here. Let's see if we just choose to export our MIDI file. So in a MIDI loop isn't going to be multiple files. It's going to be just a single particular uh, ev event. So we export a MIDI file. We'll have these different settings. So if you choose to export as type zero, this will place type zero will place it all onto one particular track. It will have multiple MIDI channels all on one track. Um, and this is often used for kind of legacy early hardware sequencers that people would use for live performance when it wasn't as easy to get a laptop that did MIDI reliably. So people would take out like a hardware sequencer and those often you load up type zero MIDI files. You can have those automatically extracted uh, when importing them into Cubase. But let me know if there's a particular reason why you need it all to be on one particular MIDI file. And once you have those, Media Bay can see both MIDI loops and MIDI files independently. So if you just come over here, we could choose, okay, I just want to see MIDI files and MIDI loops, but those are two separate entities. So I don't know other programs. There may be other programs that import MIDI loops, but I think it's really intended to work internally within Cubase that keeps track of all the metadata. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's closed or if other programs don't support it. So let me know if that's helpful for you. All right, Steve Green says, uh, also Greg, I can no longer hear the metronome, any ideas? So a lot of times when the metronome seems to mysteriously disappear, it often gets turned off in a control room. So let's say as we're playing, you can have the click track turned on here. So let's say you hit the letter C and it seems like you should be hearing the click track, but you might not hear it until it's actually go into the control room in the main area and make sure that you have the click enabled here so that you could, if this is turned off, but the metronome is turned on and it's being sent to, through the control room and it's turned off there. That's often what happens when people say they can't hear their metronome anymore. So check in the control room. All right, Mark Rabin says, Stella the pup says, lick the like. It's good, good words to live by. All right, so we see from DJR Beats, when I open Cubase, when Cubase scanned a VST3, that thing happens. Okay, so I'm not sure what thing happens. So, you know, basically the first time that you open up Cubase, 
and it's you see it scanning through your VST3 plugins. What it's doing, it's going to do just a quality assurance test to make sure that the plugin is not going to be block listed. Also, it's going to measure the latency of each plugin. So generally, it will keep those settings until new plugins are added. So if you have this happening all the time, it could be that, you know, it's a block listed plugin that you enable and Cubase is doing kind of an integrity scan of it to make sure that it's not going to uh, be altering or, or affecting the stability of your system. So, um, but if you give some more information, that would be great. All right, so we see from uh, Jan from Cubase Index. Uh, Hi, Greg, score editor, I have a question. I always work in page mode. When do I need or when is it better to use not page mode? Thank you, Jan. All right, so generally I always like to see it in page mode because it gives a sense of how the page is going to be laid out. And this could be different depending upon uh, the version of Cubase. So generally, you know, Cubase Pro has more advanced scoring and notation capabilities. So if we were to look at it, if we open up our score here, so we'll just say open our scores editor. So right now I don't really, here I can do editing of my, of my notation, but I don't see how it's kind of laid out for me how it's going to print. Um, if you come from a particular musician background where you're used to looking at a printed piece of music, which a lot of us have come from, this is when I would choose to activate page mode because this will look very familiar. And now I could make changes uh, and I could move different score elements based solely on the graphic representation so I can move this note visually without affecting its rhythmic placement because we could lay it out for how it's going to be printed on the page. So generally I prefer to always work in page mode personally because it's kind of a comfort factor. If you were doing just strictly editing of MIDI data, which most people tend to do it in the graphic piano roll editors, then you could see, you know, you're not bound by the restriction of a printed page once you're in, you know, once you're out of page mode. So I, you know, so generally as a musician who's grown up playing in orchestras, I, you know, I relate to how this is laid out for me. So I would always choose to do it in page mode. If I was just editing raw MIDI data, I may do it in the score, in the score view and not in page mode. But when I'm doing those types of edits, I generally prefer the graphic piano roll editor of the key editor. All right, so we see um, from Niam Gary a uh, question. Do you know how to fix the, uh, it says area message, maybe error message that comes up when I try to download products in the download assistant? So I'm not sure what particular error message that you're getting. So usually when you're in the download assistant, you know, it could be sometimes people will, will download programs that they don't have licenses for. Um, so, and also, you know, when you're doing this, you know, make sure that one, when you go into the download assistant that you're actually signed in. So, uh, you know, not knowing the error message that you're getting, it could be that you are in this, but you have to go into log into your account credentials directly here so that it's logged into your account. So I would check to make sure that you're logged into your account. And if you could share what exact error messages that you're getting, I can't, I'm not going to update it. Well, I have this open that, you know, make sure that you're logged into 
your my steinberg account there and that will synchronize with what you're able to download what you see in my product downloads etc All right, so we have uh, Alan David Daly saying hello, Greg, from a wet, rainy Kildar in the Republic of Ireland. I'm sure I mispronounced that, but thanks for joining us, Alan. All right, uh, Eric McCann asks, hi, Greg, how do, uh, how do I change the balance fader to different views? Right, I'll switch projects here. All right, so depending on if you have a mono, stereo, or 5.1 track, you may have different options for working with how the balance panner is shown. So let's say I have a stereo track here. All right, so in the channel settings, if we just think if we right click below that, we could have a combined panner. So if we want this to be more narrow in our panning, or if we wanted to invert the panning, so we have this view. So I just kind of right click, and then we could have a balance panner. So this would allow me to kind of pan it left or right. So with mono tracks, you know, we're going to have the ability to just route. Let me see if I have just a mono track here. Since we don't have two channels, like as we pan, but just right click. Um, let's go back to, let's say, our stereo track that we had here. But if you right click below, you can see you could switch to combined panner. And this is in 13 and or balance panner where you could just adjust the panning scheme. So anywhere that you see that, just right click and switch. Uh, in Cubase 12 and earlier, you'll see like a little triangle just to the right of the panner. And there you could switch between balance and combined. If this track is set to a like a surround output, So I'll just add a quick 5.1 output. And now this track, we're going to set its output from stereo to 5.1. And now when I go to double click in the panner, we can see that we now have a surround panner just because of the channel configuration. So in 12 and earlier for stereo tracks, kind of click in just to the right, and then you could switch between balance and combined panners. All right, Bling Bling asks, how to convert a standard copy to a shared copy? Thank you. So I don't think that we can do a uh, standard to, we can't, I, I don't know a way to convert a standard copy. So let's say if we copy this and I want, just make this larger here. And I want to make changes here that are reflected in these. Um, I would get rid of those and just hold down the shift key and as I drag out these are now shared copies so we can take these and if I delete we can see that this changes has been reflected in the shared copies so we could take a shared copy and convert that into uh, so we could edit and I think we go to functions we could convert to real copies but after the fact you know you may have done changes in you know let's say if I did an edit here on these notes and then I turn this into a shared copy of this 
you know, this could be different information than this information. So if I make an edit here and those notes aren't in this, then that could cause problems. So that's why we kind of do it from the initial copy. So we could take a shared copy, convert it to a real copy, but not a real copy into a shared copy because those may already be at different states. See, Mark Raven just says, hey, Greg, you're probably sick of hearing it by now, but thank you. So no, I'm, I never get sick of hearing that, so, so it's always appreciated. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, my chat field jump. Let me find my spot. All right, so we see uh, from Daniela Tokan, uh, in film, sound, sound minor categorization for sounds was the defector standard. With the help of Boom Sound Minor team, no open source UCS was developed rating. I did not find out, but the media bay special. So, yeah, I'm not sure if anything is really a standard for all the different libraries. So. All right, we see... Mark Ravens is telling Alan David Daly from rainy Ireland, Republic of Ireland, to keep his Cubase dry. That's good advice. All right, Billiam Walker asks, in Cubase 13, how do I prep my session to share with co-producer for mixing? They are also on Cubase 13. So if you're both running Cubase 13, you know, the easiest way to get all of your files over is just to... You know, to come over and go to your file menu and choose a backup project, and then all your files will be consolidated into a brand new folder, and you could share that folder with the other producer. So generally, if you're running, you know, the one thing that could be problematic is if you're using different third-party plugins that the mix engineer doesn't have. Uh, so that could be the only thing that would need some prep work. Uh, but if you communicate about which plugins are being used, you know, sharing this session files between different Cubase versions, um, there's really not much prep work to do at all. It's just really, uh, you know, getting the files over to them. So again, you know, if you maybe had, you know, imported different loops from different locations or recorded files into different folders, the backup project would consolidate all those files. And then, you know, generally I would say if you're handing it to someone for mixing, they may have more plugins than you do, but, you know, maybe communicate with them what third-party plugins you're actually using and see if they have those. And maybe you could, you know, have an equivalent or if you have a third-party compressor saying, you could say I was using this ratio with, you know, and kind of give some basic settings and you could carry that forth in the project notepad as well. So if you wanted to set up sections here, you could have, um, you know, just, just in the project itself, you could have, um, the notepad and here you could just have text that's you know different notes about the project that you could pass on other things that are always handy to do is make sure you have like files named so you can say you know electric piano something like that so if they wanted to replace the sound they know what it is that you know the audio files are named beforehand so you know i know producers getting files from other people and they see, you know, audio zero one, audio zero two, audio zero three. 
And instead of kick, snare, bass, electric guitar, acoustic guitars, and naming your files could also help the person on the on the other end of getting your project. All right, so we have Vincent uh, just says, uh, is there a way to remove unused group tracks slash effects tracks? My wish is to be able to remove these similar to the remove empty tracks function. All right, let's just give it a shot here. Let's see if we can do it maybe in a project logical editor. So I'm not sure if there's an automated way. We'll take a look, see if we could do it. don't think that there's a way to determine if no signals are sent to it. Um, if you're in doubt, let's say if we go to, uh, we open up the channel strip here, you know, one of the things you could do is all right, so So I'm going to look at my sources here. Okay, so one way of determining if a group, you know, has no, nothing being sent to it. So I don't know of an automated way to do it, but a way to quickly determine is if you open up the channel settings. If you see no source here, so let's say I have this group, I see no source, but I'll add a group track to seven. So now that I select a particular group, um, we see that there's no source for group one. And then this, this effect channel, um, so we select, let's say this, so we have group two, let me just, just a preference here set up, sorry. So as you would select, you know, it, to find quickly. So I don't know a way to automatically delete it if nothing is being sent to it. If it if you're utilizing VST3 plugins and on those particular groups, and you have the preference under 
plugins set to suspend VSD3 plugin processing. It's not going to take any additional source, any additional CPU, but we could see that when we go to uh, group two, that we have, we could have audio seven as our source feeding it, but I select my mono delay. It says no source. That means I could delete that particular track. Group one has no source. So I could just kind of, if I'm in doubt as to which particular files have nothing sent to them at that point, I could delete it, but I don't know of a way to within the project logical editor to say there's nothing there's no sources to these tracks delete them because it's, it's not necessarily an input but you could find it pretty easily and then remove the unused group or effects channels all right ness asks uh, hi, Greg. In, in Edit Very Audio, I have the acoustic feedback speaker on, but no sound. What am I doing wrong? So it could be, you know, make sure that you have the control room routed. So we'll come over to... Because the preview channel is going to be routed through the control room. So double-click here. We'll go to... Very audio. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my audio connections. Let's go to my control room. I'm gonna disable this. And I'll go to my outputs and let's enable my control room. So when I go to audition, I don't hear anything. We'll make sure the acoustic feedback is on. So it could also, so make sure, and it could be now that we go to our uh, studio connections, like here, if I right click, we have this set as main mix. But try to, if you're going into your, you know, try going into the audio connections and try routing it through, not the outputs here, but through the control room. And you want it to go through the monitor here. So I have this going out and now it's going to be just routed directly through the control room once that's turned on. So try going through the control room and see if that makes a difference. All right, so we see Arif B uh, asks, question, uh, when you create slices in the sample editor, is it possible to use an octave for each piece? So I think it's gonna map it out chromatically so you know, a lot of people would, you know, so let's take a look at it here. So let's say, so I'm not sure if it's in the, if it's in the sampler track or in the sample editor. Okay, so let's say I'm in the sample editor here for all right, so I'll go to my hit points and we'll adjust our sensitivity here. So these will just kind of be mapped out chromatically if we have this in a sampler track. So you know so right now it's not really aligned to any particular MIDI notes until it goes into an instrument. So if I have my sampler control here or in Groove Agent, it'd be very similar that now when we create slices, this is when it will automatically assign the pitch chromatically for each slice. 
And, you know, I think it makes sense to do it chromatically because you may have, let's say in your MIDI, uh, you have eight octaves. So if you want it one note per octave, you, you know, you and you have more than eight slices um, that, or, you know, if you have more than, you have 128 MIDI notes, so per octave, let's say that's 12, 10 notes. So if you have more than 12 slices, if you want it like one each slice to be on its own octave, you know, you could do, you know, so you, you could do that, but also if you want it to, you know, if I wanted to now take, you know, like this particular, so if we wanted to create uh, a slice, so I'm going to slice the audio here. So let's say I want to take just this. Let me just, uh, we'll go back here. Let me just create events. So now if I dragged this event into the sampler track, so I can have one note here. So I'm not sure if you want this only you know, like, you know, different notes to be mapped chromatically, but generally it's going to be mapped, assigned to notes, like for octaves, when it's loaded into an instrument. Okay, so we see uh, from Mike Weiser, this is a question I'm experiencing crashing while using Cubase 12 where the screen freezes up and then shows a graphic error. Is there something I need to change in Cubase to correct this or is this a Windows 11 issue? So often, you know, you know, we hear lots of issues like this with NVIDIA graphics drivers, something that you could try and it's not on the Mac OS version, which I'm running. Uh, but see if you make a change, if you go into the preferences on Windows, which is under the edit menu, uh, you can go to general. So see if the behavior changes. If you, you'll see an enable high DPI function. So see what happens if you toggle that status or if you have any scaling on. But generally that's going to be kind of related to graphics card drivers. And there's lots of information on Google if you have like NVIDIA graphics uh, for different changes. Basically, you don't want it to be in gaming mode. You want it to be more not in gaming mode for better DAW performance. All right, so we see from Daniela Tokan says, uh, are, we are close to 16 gigabytes of our own sounds recorded, including Foley's. It's not important to have a sound or patch. It's important for a team to find a specific needed sound in very short time. So, you know, people do that with, you know, much you know, significantly larger sound effects libraries in Media Bay every day. So... All right, so we see from Secret Studios, Greg, can a macro or project logical editor execute combo uh, import audio files from a pre-decided folder to have the audio import it uh, at a set sample rate and bit depth and three have colors and folders and channels set via file name. So we can choose. Um, so the first one, there is a way to automatically go to a specific folder. If you go to the project and go to the project setup here, you could choose uh, for number two, it would automatically uh, store the sample rate in bit depth here. And three for changing the colors based on file names, we could do that. So let's say I'll just do a new project here. And you could run those as a macro for that using multiple project logical editor conditions. So let's say I'll add a couple audio tracks. So we'll say bass. Guitar. Let's 
guitar, drums, also, and let's add a group folder. Set a colorize based on names. So we'll call this Vox. We could go into the project logical editor. And we could say we want to transform. And we'll say name contains base. And we want to come over here. We will choose set color set to a fixed value and I want my base to always be this color. So now I could just come over and colorize based on that particular name. So we could save that as a preset and let's say we want this name contains guitar. I want it to be fixed to red. So now any track that's called guitar Sorry, I'll just we could name colors as well. So, and let's say uh, name contains like fox. So at this point, you could say okay, I want it to be green. So you could colorize. So we could do is save each of those as a preset and then run those project logical editor presets within a macro. And then you could just uh, kind of batch colorize your entire project very quickly. So number two is kind of done. Uh, sample rate and bit depth is just part of the project that you created. So you're going to do that as a project is created. And the colors could be changed, but I don't know a way to have it automatically import from a predestined folder. All right, so we see from uh, Shandan Kumar. Hey, Greg, uh, if and when I automate a volume fader, is there a way to use the volume fader as usual without it being continuously affected by automation? Um, so if you're automating a fader, it will be affected by the automation on the track. So, but let's come over here and just say, okay, I have, let's open up the automation lane for my bass track here. So when I go to automate, we'll zoom in here. So let's say I'm automating along. Right. So I'm just holding my mouse down and we'll do some more changes here. So, you know, if you're automating your fader, it will automate and, you know, changes will, you know, further automations can be affected by automation. So if I just come in the middle here and want to automate, you know, part, let's say while we're playing here and I just want to do a quick automation here, I could just let go and then you're right back. But, you know, if you're going to choose to automate something, it will, you know, be automated and, you know, and it will affect automation. Now, sometimes when I get this question, uh, people may want to come over here and as they're automating, so let's say we start here and I want to do just like a quick automation bump and I let go, they expect the fader to go back to its to where where you started and why it doesn't do that is because just like a physical fader it needs to have a return point so if you want to do kind of an automation starting here since we have an automation point after that now i when i let go of the automation it's going to return to that value but if there's no value to return to just like a physical fader it will stay 
at that particular value until it sees another automation point. So let me know if that makes sense. And if you, you know, don't want the, you know, if you don't want the automation that's on there to take effect, you know, all you have to do is just, you know, come right over here and just tell it to not read the automation. So we can see the existing automation here. Or if you want it to follow automation or not, just disable read automation on a particular track. All right, wonderful to see Sable Winters on. She's like number 48. Thank you for joining. Great to see you on. All right, so we see uh, from maybe a follow-up point on the automation, says, uh, and Mark Raven had also commented on this, wouldn't it disable not read all the automation? No, because I do want the automation happening, just I want all the points to go a little lower or higher using the fader. So, you know, you could try to come over here, and if you go into the automation panel, so say we have automation turned on, uh, try just to put it into trim and then as we adjust kind of the fader here so I'll just put it into trim mode and let me just write the automation so I come here So now that trim mode was enabled, we can see kind of what my trim, we see our original automation values that are preserved here. And then we just changed, we, you know, once we went into the automation panel, which is F6, so turn trim mode on, and then we lowered that and that will lower all of the automation from that particular point in time. So we see kind of, the original automation, when we dropped it by several dB here, at that point, all the subsequent automation curves have also dropped. So try using trim mode for that. And then you could just come over here and if you wanted to freeze the trim mode automation, so. And Jesse Jose also just says VCA faders are good for this as well. But if you didn't want to use a VCA fader and you just want to drop everything, you know, try trim mode. All right, so Vincent asks, uh, I'm currently able to show all EQ automation via key command. However, is it possible to show all EQ automation of the selected track? Okay. Right, so let me go ahead and just write automation here. Okay, so now when we close our, so we have our guitar automation. So just want to come over to show EQ automation. All right, so we see that on 
Let's just see if there's a way to Try it just automating that one more time here. Do a new project. Okay, so let's say we want to Okay, so I have automation on audio zero one, so we could use that to show EQ. It's gonna show it on every track. So I, let's try Project Logical Editor. So let's try unfolding track. So and we'll say our property is set to track is selected. Try this parent. Yeah, I could play around with it and see if I come up with the see if I can get a project logical editor going for 
Friday, but I think, you know, this is designed to kind of show EQ of all of the particular tracks, um, but not just a selected track, but I'll see if I could come up with something, maybe with a project logical editor. Sorry about that. All right, so we see from, uh, I guess it's Ocelot 147. Thanks for the clear explanation regarding randomizing notes in a logical editor. Hopefully it's helpful. All right, so we see Glorian, uh, who deleted my question. So I don't think I saw it, but uh, make, just simply ask it again. Sometimes the questions are more than 200 characters. Okay, so we see from Daniela Tokan. Uh, okay, I did find a metas in the media player to activate. How do I search all sounds of Robert Dudzik, for example, in Media Bay? And the fields are protected. How to protect own sounds and are the tags. So let's say we want to look for Robert Dudzik files. So let's open up, not, not to pull, but. Right, so let's come over here. Let's go to VST Sound, and I think that we could. Make sure I have his name spelled right. All right, so let's say I just searched for Dudzik here. Um, and let's just kind of look, go to our settings. And then we want to see, I think there's like an author or creator. So as you see, I just typed in Dudzik and he's pulled up all of his sounds that he did in Backbone. We just find the I think that there is a author or creator tag here. The uh, author. So now when we come over, so we can see the author of all these is Robert Dudzik. So again, just kind of click on the settings and show which particular tags you want and then you can find all of Robert Dudzik's wonderful sounds such a great guy He's so incredibly talented with his sound design all right JH asks is there a way to make half tempo like using project logical editor so I could toggle easily to record things with my terrible piano skills all right, so if we have a project, let's say our project is at uh, 100 beats a minute. I'll t just take a quick project where I know that's the tempo. Yeah, I set this up for uh, one of the engineers on, uh, on Thriller. So, it's kind of, so let's say we have our tempo here is 100 beats a minute. So if I quickly want to take the 
so let's say if we have a tempo track, let's just see if we have one out. So we'll add a tempo track here. And we see our tempo track to value is set to 100 beats a minute. So let's go to the project logical editor and say, we want to transform and we're going to say media type is equal to tempo. Uh, and we will say that we are going to And we'll say divide by two. So now we're playing back at. Then I'll hit apply. And let me place all the. set all these tracks to be in musical mode. And let me just turn off the divide track list here. All right, so our tempo value here is set Say it's activated. So say we're at 100 beats a minute now. Now that everything's in. All right, so we're gonna say our tempos. Now we're playing at 50 beats a minute. So you can just save this as a preset, basically saying we're gonna take our metronome or our tempo track and divide it by two. Then you could play it in slow. And then we're now at 25 beats a minute. So again, choose transform. Media type is equal to tempo. We want to make sure that we have a tempo track activated and then we're going to divide that tempo track in half. And then you can play back, you can play record in at a slower tempo and then speed it up and it'll magically seem like you're a wonderful player. All right, so we see from Glorian, uh, hi there, Greg. Are there any discussions there at Steinberg towards moving Cubase to Linux platforms? So, you know, generally I'm not in any development discussions. I just work for the US distributor. I'm not actually technically a Steinberg employee, um, but I haven't heard of any plans for it. I think, you know, it makes sense from a business standpoint to, you know, Mac and Windows are obviously very dominant in DAW fields and then having to, you know, create kind of an ASIO type layer for <clears throat> for an entirely new operating system where every plugin would have to be rewritten, every audio interface would, you know, probably had to have a new driver to work with it as well. So All right, wonderful to see Dwight Cunningham checking in from the Bahamas. Glad you can make it today. OK, 
Okay, so we see uh, Steve Green says Spectral Layers 10 issue. Nope, if you edit a track, then drag it back into the project. That's when I lose the playback sound. All right, so let me try that. Um, but also, you know, just make sure that, you know, if you're running it inside of inside of Cubase via Spectral Layers as well. Let us know if you're doing that. So. Just create a new audio file here in Cubase so it don't affect. Okay, so let's see if I... So now let's say so there is the file imported. So you could hear where I did the spectral edit. There's a spectral edit where I just kind of took out the mid range. So, you know, but, you know, also if you could let me know why you just, you know, if there's a particular reason you're not using kind of the, um, you know, using ARA2 to kind of get the communication back and forth. And here we could update the Cubase file. So I'll just say yes. So as we play here. So there's the file that's updated. Let's see if this is probably the... So now the file is updated in Cubase. So this is the original one, not the one that was imported. So you can hear the difference. So but let me know still if I'm doing something different. See, uh, Game Verse London, are you all about beats or do you know about vocals? Yeah, so I've done lots of vocals as well. So you see, oh, this is official Cubase. So just whatever questions you have, we can answer.
All right. Uh, Aggressive asks, hey, Greg, I just got a Cubase 12 Pro version. Is there a version of Spectral Layers inclusive, I guess included, or do I need to buy it extra? So with Cubase Pro 12, uh, and if you just got it, you're probably also eligible for Cubase Pro 13. Uh, but you, you know, you could check into my vouchers area, but Cubase Pro 12 and Cubase Pro 13 come with Spectral Layers 1, which is kind of a scaled down version of Spectral Layers. Uh, you could still purchase Spectral Layers Elements or Spectral Layers Pro, but you do get a Spectral Layers 1, which you could download from the from your Steinberg Download Assistant in your Cubase 12 area. All right, we see Sway TV and Recording Studio says, hi, thanks for all the info. You're welcome. All right, so we see Naeem Gary says, uh, the error message that popped up on yours is the one I've been getting. So if, if you could just remind me what the error message was. So uh, I know it's probably... This is probably almost an hour old now, so if, maybe if you could get it, we'd get into it. All right, Quellen asks, how can I record without latency and some plugins into the mic recording channel? So, you know, figure that some plugins, as you're using plugins, and we could think of uh, a, a plug-in tax could often be the latency that's associated with. So some plugins will have particular latencies. If you go to the uh, studio menu, to your VST plugin manager, and we click on a particular plugin, you could see what the latency is of each plugin. So let's say if I go to my Vox comp, this is going to be 96 samples. If I get a vocal chain that has more, that's 10,670 samples. So while you're recording, you know, you probably don't want to put a plugin that has a lot of latency on the input path. So, and that's just the time it takes for that plugin to do processing. Audio that's already been recorded the plug-in latency will be compensated for automatically, but it's just kind of a physics thing. Now, if you want to quickly bypass plugins that have high latency, that's why we have the constrained delay compensation button in the lower left-hand side. And what that'll do is just simply bypass the particular plugin, the plugins that have a high latency, and then you could turn it on after recording. But again, some plugins will have latency and so generally, you know, with those plugins, choose maybe not to record through those plugins and use it after the file has been recorded and during the mix process. All right, so we see M. Sully has some comments on the score editor. It says uh, if you've says he didn't like the score editor in previous comments. says if you've never used an R score program, then it might seem okay. It just seems that Steinberg got the score editor job to the same clown who made the logical editor. So different people, but you realize that the needs of a of a scoring application within the sequencer are often much different than the needs of a dedicated scoring program. And that's why Steinberg has Dorico and Steinberg has Cubase because those are different requirements and different workflows as well. All right, so we see question. The EQ in your channel window has knobs. Can I have this in Cubase 12? So let's come over here. So all you have to do is when you go to the EQ section, I think that if we go to the EQ settings, uh, we could show them as sliders or we could show them as knobs. So just go to the settings window right here and then you could switch back and forth between sliders and knobs. And that work in Cubase 12 as well as Cubase 
seven earlier. Chatfield just jumped. Let me see if I can find where I was. Okay. I see some discussion probably. All right, so Val asked a question in Media Bay, what does a red folder mean and how do I solve it? So I think red folders, it's... So does a red folder mean that it's just scanning? Let me just pop over to my computer here real quick. Okay, so let's say if I'm in this particular folder here, I want to go to Documents. So while I'm here, if we rescan, let's say if we rescan the disk, is that when it turns red? So I'm going to say sometimes it's when it's like scanning. Let's say if I come over here to VST3 presets and so let me know if it's like when you're rescanning particular files, Val. Or if you want to send a picture of it. All right, great to see Tiago from Brazil. All right, so we have uh, Yash on. Great to see you on the live stream. <clears throat> All right, so we have J. O. Oh, it says, uh, let me clear my throat. It says, uh, Greg Undo, the best. Thank you so much for your dedication. The first time I heard your name was from the great Hans Zimmer. He was right. The best. A hug from Portugal. Uh, thank you for the kind words. It's always a pleasure getting to help Hans and his team. So. All right, so we see a question. Uh, how can I copy my insert setting on different track? Example, quad guitar with same setting. Okay. So let's say on this particular track, let's say I have my guitars. I'll just go to my mix console view here. 
slide over. Let's just add some guitars. Let's add some plugins here. Okay. So I want to copy the inserts from one track to another. So really all I have to do is hold down. Let me see if I just grab, I think if I just grab the inserts. Say it's usually I get it just by I mean just make it a little wider so we can see it a little. I think it's usually just kind of a let me try in a main mixer. So if you copy first Solano channel selectings and then paste. You could do it just kind of like that. Um, but there is a way just to kind of. So if I just. So we, it's one at a time, but there is a way to do it. I'm just having a... Yeah, so you could try just to grab. And let me just see if that does the EQs as well. So we select at the bottom, hold down the alter option key that will copy over all the settings, but there is, um, okay. Okay. Here it is. Sorry. My brain cramp. Let me just, so if we select the insert field here and go to the next insert field while holding down the alt key, then that will copy over the insert. So do it from like the inserts header, hold down the alter option key, drag, and then just the inserts will carry over without the EQs or other channel settings. So select kind of right here at the very top, hold down alt or option. You'll see the plus sign and then release and then all the inserts will be copied over. Sorry about that. All right, so we have Mohammed Salah says, hello, Mr. Greg, I hope you're fine. So I'm doing great, thank you. Thanks for being on the live stream. All right, and Muhammad has a little question about uh, very audio in Cubase Pro 13, so feel free to ask. All right, uh, Muhammad Salah asks, uh, very audio is not in sync with the projects when I play and always solo, even if I didn't make it solo. All right, so let's go ahead and take a quick look. I'll revert this project. We'll do some very audio in the bass. Okay, so now.
So now I'm just going to hit. So it's in sync here. So I've never had it go out of sync, but make sure that, you know, sometimes if you're, if you have multiple files that are stacked, make sure that you have the right file that's stacked. You know, if you have like different layers of audio underneath, which is, can be common with vocals. A lot of times if I'm dealing with very audio, because if you have, you know, like hundreds of different vocal edits, what I like to do is to come over to like a, so let's say I have multiple clips here of audio, so different recordings. So what I want to do is to, I'm gonna duplicate this track version. And then on the duplicated track version, I'm going to create a new contiguous file. So I'll say, let's just bounce selection. I'll replace the events. So now instead of going back to have three or, you know, maybe with a vocal, lots of edits that are pieced together. Now I could go into very audio and do all the editing here. And if I needed to go back to the original edits, I go back to my track versions and then I could have a separate track version. That's just for my very audio edits. So it sounds like maybe you have audio files that are stacked and maybe it's doing editing of ones that are stacked versus other ones. So maybe give that a try. So try to duplicate a track version and then bounce selection. And that creates a separate audio file that you could do tuning on. And then you could jump back to do all of your edits as necessary. Uh, and we see kind of further uh, comment it says, and continue from the last position inside the very audio editor. So let's say I'm in the very audio editor. So this could be just a transport setting. So if we go to our start mode, if you have return to start position on stop, it'll, so let's say if I start here, start playing back from here. When my start mode in transport, 13 is set to return to start position on stop you know it can just go back um, directly to the selection but if we change our start mode here so go to transport just check your start mode and you can say start from project cursor and to turn off return to start position on stop so now when I'm doing very audio editing I can stop and just continue right from there. If I go to transport, to start mode and activate, return to start position on stop. Some people like this for editing because they could, and then kind of go from there. So check your uh, transport and your start mode settings. So check those out and that could be affecting your very audio transport behavior as well. Development of avoid ask question. Why are you so awesome? Thanks again for all your continuous help. So probably my wife doesn't think I'm so awesome. So you know, my, probably my son isn't that impressed, but thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Just trying to help people out. All right, Mark Rabin says uh, some ideas for his channel they think would be would help tremendously. A way to see the question in text as being currently discussed would be great. So probably by the time I typed up the question, you know, it would we would maybe get through, you know, a lot less questions, I think. I understand kind of the, the need for it, uh, but trying to navigate typing the question or copying the question from one computer to another and taking up that space of real estate where like a function maybe, you know, that I need to show to answer the question might be in that particular area and moving a window around could take a while, but I'll see if there's any way to do it. Let's 
So he says, uh, Mark just says, looks like a way to see screen above. Screen share would be ideal. A way for Greg to see the current chat in real time so he can see responses, additions to the questions he's answering. So, yeah, since I'm kind of doing a, a one-man show for the streaming and answering all the questions, it's hard, you know, if someone else was managing that, it would it would be nice, but then someone would have to sit here for, uh, some other employee would have to sit here and, and probably type that in because it's hard to do kind of all by myself. But I'll see if there's some solution for that. All right, we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, Cubase 13 Pro. Can you cover the considerations of when to use the EQ built into each channel track versus an EQ like frequency on an insert? So I think the built-in EQ is very powerful. So there's a lot of things that people don't necessarily know about it. One is, you know, coming over here and typing in like the note name. So I want to go to G5 and being able to set the frequency like that, being able to right click to invert the band. So once you found kind of an annoying frequency, you could come over and if you hold down modifier keys, like such as my control or command key, I can't, I can only change the frequency, uh, holding down alt or option. Now I can't change the gain. I could only change the frequency versus before. So I would control command. I could only change the, the gain or cut and with shift, um, I could only adjust the Q. So it's very easy to kind of navigate here. So I think for like, you know, a, just like you would use maybe a very specific EQ, like for general EQ purposes, and this coupled with the ability to come over and say, okay, I want my low cut filters. I want these to be set at, you know, 90, you know, 48 dB of cut, um, makes this a very powerful EQ. And if you wanted something more surgical, uh, and you need more bands, that's when I would consider using frequency. Frequency will allow us to have eight bands. And again, we could see kind of our uh, piano keyboard going along here. Uh, we have kind of the same EQ controls on a stereo track. Let me just pop over to, I'll add a stereo track. When you go to frequency, some of the things that are nice additions when dealing in stereo with frequency will be the ability to, as we work with this, to have, if we're in stereo, that we could have an independent uh, left and right. So when I come over here, we could say band four, I want it to boost the left channel here, but I want it to cut the right channel. And band three, we could have this be mid side so if we need to EQ just the middles, just the middle part of the panning spectrum, not the middle part of the frequencies, but if I wanted to take away low end at particular frequencies here for just a middle, but I wanted to make the sides like the left and right edges, if this were a panning spectrum, I wanted to make the sides brighter and with different uh, styles of EQ. Also, there is the audition mode, auto listen, so that you could hear only the particular changes that you're making on a single band. That's really nice. So again, you know, so this will give you left to right. It also gives you kind of the dynamics processing. So if we want to look at this where, you know, we want it to be very surgical with our dynamics processing. So we can say on my right channel, I want to take these lows away, but I want it to be able to compress them. So at this point we could activate dynamic EQ mode. So, you know, more surgical options with the frequency. And if you wanted to do just, you know, basic channel EQ, that's really effective and sounds great. The channel EQ is a wonderful choice for that as well. Let's see, Mark Rabin just saying, uh, says that Google could certainly afford development should implement on live feeds for us. So that'd be nice. I, I think it's a great platform that we're able to even do this on YouTube 
and people could interact live, you know, like 15 years ago, you know, could, couldn't imagine doing this. And I would have to be on planes incessantly going to different cities for presentations where now we could do so much of this live on screen share. So, so I'm happy that we could at least have a forum. It could always be better, but I'm glad that we have what we have. All right, uh, Yash asks, uh, please go over the different stretch algorithms. Okay, so there are different types of stretching algorithms for, you know, and the most popular one in the industry, it's used by many DAWs is Elastic Pro. Uh, so we have standard and this will be for compatibility with legacy. And we can see that if you want to do like a full mix or if you wanted to do one for pads or drums or kind of vocals, we could think of a solo that we could use algorithms like this. And Elastic, we broken down into three categories. Um, so the most common one is going to be Elastic Time, and this will be more set up so that we could actually, uh, as you know, we're dealing with more rhythmic elements, think of it as more transient based, drums, percussion, maybe rhythm guitar, uh, if you want to do something that's very pitch, maybe piano, vocal, we, that's when the pitch algorithm could be a benefit. And then we have tape. And tape, when we slow down a recording, it's going to mimic the, the change not only of the tempo, but of pitch like an analog tape machine doing very speed functions. Now, depending, so we have, those are the three basic categories and we have an efficient mode. So if you have a, like a really old computer and you need it to, you know, do warping, like, you know, change the tempo in real time on many tracks, but your computer is 20 years old, then you could use the efficient algorithms. And there's also formant preservation. So, you know, sometimes when you do particular time stretching of vocals, you know, it could almost sound like, you know, you know, a term that's often used in audio circles is munchkinization kind of, or like chipmunks, like where they would do old records recorded slow and speed it up and make it sound like chipmunks were singing, you know, so we could also choose to preserve the format. So the cost of format preservation and the cost of you know, the regular algorithms would be that they have slightly more CPU usage. So, but for most modern computers, it's not really a big hit. All right, uh, Darren Flake asks, hi Greg, how, did, how to clip gain the signal using the range tool without cutting the audio so we don't get those crossfade cuts effects in vocals, let's say, thanks. All right, so as you do, let's just come over here and let's say we do a clip gain change with the range tool. So I'm gonna come over here, let's say I wanted to boost this. Uh, so I'm gonna hit Shift X and then we switched our object selection tool and now I could adjust clip gain like on a particular word so if you want to do clip gain that way and you didn't want any adverse effects like okay maybe when i you know one is to make sure that you actually have zero crossing enabled so when you come over here um you'll see snap to zero crossing so this will prevent you from making an edit so let's say like this point here, this point here is what's called a zero crossing point. So if this is turned on and I try and I turn off my snap. So we see that we turn J off that I try to cut right here. It's only going to allow me to cut kind of at the zero crossing. If my zero crossing is turned off at that point, this is more susceptible to pops and clicks. Another way to resolve this issue, if you do this and you have an inadvertent pop or click, you know, so A, by default, just leave the zero crossings on. You'll see this little function here called auto fades. And while you don't see this uh, actually on the waveform, what this will do is you could just turn on auto fades in and out. 
and any time that there is a cut, it will do a slight cross. It will do a slight cross fade between the two sections, or fade in, fade out automatically. So it just does it audibly. You don't see it visually, but that could prevent a lot of fades, a lot of clicks and pops being made when doing edits. But you know, also just make sure that you have the snap to zero crossing, which is enabled by default right there. And then when you do the cut, it's not going to be in the middle of the amplitude, it's going to be at the zero crossing point. All right, so I see from DJFK just saying flat or not, every tone, color, ooh, group, copy, duplicate. I see Darren is asking, has question marks, so he seems as So uh, maybe DJFK, if you could ask your question, if you have a full question, that'd be great. I'd be happy to answer. Mark Rabin asks, uh, what is, anyone used a, the Vocal Writer Waves plugins? Any plan for Steinberg to develop similar plugin functions? So I think, you know, a lot of the compressors in the end get the same result, may not move the fader up and down. But I think it always uh, very easily will get you the same result just using kind of some basic compression. All right, so we see Tim Weinheimer checking in from Mission Viejo. I hope you're surviving the storm okay. He's getting soaked in California, just seeing all the coverage of that. And hope your house is safe. And once again, it was great to see you at NAM and be able to meet you and spend time there with you. All right, Jay from Secret Studios. Uh, one last question, hopefully, for today. You could ask as many questions as you want. Um, is it possible to, in Project Logical Editor, to create new folders and batch import files based on name and moved into them. So we could create a, uh, a folder track, but I don't think that in the project logical editor that we could have the tracks automatically imported to the particular folder automatically. So I'll, I'll play around with it, but I know that we can, as a precondition, that we could create a folder and, but I don't think that we could define tracks to be imported into that folder, but you can literally, you know, pretty easily just kind of drag and drop files to do that. All right, uh, Gary Strauss asks from Orlando, Florida, Cubase 13 on i7 PC. Hi, Greg. Uh, I'm trying to get my M Audio Oxygen 61 to change synth presets using MIDI remote, uh, but so far, no luck. Any suggestions? So I'm not sure if you're changing synth presets inside of virtual instruments. Many VST instruments from third parties and even from Steinberg won't respond to MIDI program changes. If it is a hardware synthesizer, it should respond to standard MIDI program changes. It's not anything that you have to set up in a MIDI remote scenario, but you should be able to just transmit the MIDI program change. So, and a lot of instruments may also just as they're open. So let's come over here, let's add an instrument. We'll say Retrolog. And when I come over to the list, you know, it's just using kind of the down arrow keys and then you could load it up and just kind of come over here and as you click and go down that will automatically load the sound as soon as you leave it on so just using the down arrow keys so maybe you don't have to use a keyboard uh, like a midi controller for that but just the down and up arrow keys depending on the instrument
Right, reading through comments. All right, we see Michael Teams checking in from Weatherford, Texas. Thanks for joining us. I believe the virtual ice cream distribution will begin. All right, wonderful to see Gareth on. So we have three-fourths of Hot Mess. Hope you like the bass line for the song Ting Ting. Be a tease for everyone. Oh, I'm glad Gareth liked the bass line. All right. Hope waiting for other people to hear some of the new Hot Mess material. Uh, Beeble asks, question, is there a way to automatically, to automatic set warp marker for multi-track audio warp editing for multi-track drums, and can they be stored as MIDI? So if we have warp markers, so let's say, you know, once we come over, uh, the warp markers can be actually determined from hit points. So for the initial values, let's say if I'm, here we go into the sample editor. Let's go to hit points. So I'm going to edit the hit points and we're in our hit point tab. And I'm just going to make sure that we're not like including tracks that are kind of bleeding through. We'll adjust our intensity here. All right. So we look at our track, we could see where our hit points are. So just from we double click and we see the hit points uh, sample editor inspector here. We could choose, you'll see a create tab. Click to open the and ex expand the create tab. You can create warp markers and also MIDI notes. So I'm going to say, let's put these as C1. Hit OK. Now our MIDI notes have been defined. When we go into warp editing, clear my throat. Now that we're in warp editing, we'll go to free warp. Sorry, you get to the right tool. We'll choose free warp. And then as we zoom in, we can see the warp points. And we see that these are in sync with the MIDI. Once we move the warp points, the MIDI won't necessarily align. But So once you find the hit points, go into the sample editor. Once you have the... the threshold and intensity dialed in. You can make warp markers, MIDI, you can make regions, markers, create a groove, or make slices all from those particular hit points. All right, so we see from Benny, uh, is it possible to switch MIDI control with shortcut uh, Cubase 13 Pro? So if um, we have multiple, so we have multiple MIDI controllers active. So I could see uh, like my Korg Nano control, my Nectar controller here. So these can be active and we don't have to, you know, any of these could be functional just by grabbing the controller. If it's within a single controller, what you could do is, let's say, for instance, I want to do, uh, we're going to set this up, and I wanted to be able, to, like, I had one mapping page, and we could think of mapping pages, and mapping pages can be created uh, right here. So we go to the mapping assistant, we could click on the plus sign, and this would give us a number. Uh, I'll select my Cork Nano control here. And we could have a number of mapping pages. And we could define particular buttons. When we go into our uh, mapping page actions, so once we've created a map, so if it's using uh, like a MIDI note or MIDI control 
I'll just reread it. So just switch MIDI control with a shortcut. So at this point, you could actually program a button to switch to different mapping pages. So at this point, you could just say, you know, I'm doing this across eight, uh, the eight effect sends on particular channels. And at that point, um, I could, you know, do all these actions for send one. I hit this button, I could do all these actions for send two, send three, send four. And what that button could actually do is load up a mapping page directly from the function. So look under mapping page actions, if that's what you want to do, Benny. And then you could have buttons that switch to different control functions within the same controller. All right, sorry, my chat field jumped. I'm trying to find my spot. Bear with me just for a second. All right, so we see from uh, Chill Illuminate. Uh, hi, Greg, thanks for all you do. Question one, how to activate editor mode to create hit points? Sometimes the editor is on, sometimes it's not when double click any audio file and two uh, tricks on awesome wah-wah for the bass. Okay, so, you know, make sure, so, you know, there could be different, uh, different inspector modes here. So. If I so right now I I'm in kind of the channel inspector. When I double click on an event, we can see that all of the options for the sample editor will it, this will all switch over to the sample editor. If I click on the track, we're back on the track. I cl double click on the event, then we can see all of the sample editing functions directly there. So that would be. You know, so just be aware of that so you can see your channel settings. Now, some people may want to see only the sample editor and see all the channel settings directly in the new channel inspector. But if you are in the sample editor and you click here, just double click on an event and that will launch all of the sample editing controls right there. All right, and the second question was, tricks on awesome wah-wah for the bass. All right, let's take a listen to some bass here. All right, so we'll come over here to, I think we could even go into the virtual bass amp. Listen to that in context. So maybe like on long notes, you could just automate this. Then as you rewind, all the automation will play back. So yeah, big always always have fun with pedals on bass. I usually don't use pedals, but yeah, you get great fun stuff like that and very creative. All right, Nick is online. He says, hey, people, hope you're all well and have pressed the like button. All 
All right, uh, Milan Tomka asks, Hi, Greg, is there a way to quickly transfer event slices of one WAV file from one track version to another? File is the same, but repaired from noise or bleed. All right, so... Right, so I'm going to come over here and let's create some slices. All right, let's take it out of musical mode here. Okay, so now we have slices. Um, okay, so let's say I'll just undo that. Okay, so maybe what I would do is if we're doing different track versions is maybe duplicate the track version. So I guess we want to take, all right, quickly transfer event slices. So let's say, all right, so I'm not sure if it's just hit points. So let's say, So maybe if we come over here, we duplicate the track version. And then if you have done edits here, this way the slices are the same between the two different track versions. So we come here and let's say we go to, so, you know, maybe if you, I'm not sure if you've done all the edits before you duplicated the track slices, but if you, you know, if you do the slices and then do, and then choose to duplicate the track version, that will still be maintained. And then you could do editing on one and you had the same uh, track, you had the same slices on both track versions. But let me know if that makes sense or if that doesn't work for you. All right, Illuminate asks, Hi, Greg, how do I detect pitch accuracy of an audio event and then fine-tuning it flat or sharp? So often what you could do is, you know, very if it's kind of a monophonic event, just go directly over here to Vary Audio. And we'll just choose to edit Vary Audio. So let's say, okay, you're doing this and you're always at your... You know, you may have to come over here and then for, you know, each of the audio slices. So, you know, and, and this is obviously designed for more monophonic audio sources like vocals or, you know, maybe a guitar solo, saxophone solo. And then if you wanted to, you know, do tuning on it or be able to do fine tuning so we could have it snap you know, snap to a particular pitch if you wanted to have fine control over it. If you hold down the alt or shift, or I'm sorry, just hold down the shift key, then you can freely place it wherever you want. Uh, and if you don't hold down the shift key, it will snap to kind of a diatonic or just to a musical center piece. But you could... Just come in here and choose to adjust and correct pitch on the particular words so, or a particular sounds right there. And I think, let's say, if we just take even just a portion of the file... If we could do this, all right. 
So we just replace that event. And if we go to, not sure if it shows up here, it might show up in Wave Lab. Um, but you can see the pitch here, the estimated pitch. If you go to, if you select just a file, go to audio to statistics. And here you can see the estimated pitch. So if you wanted to be able to apply a pitch shift, either from fine tuning or transpose, you could do it right there as well. Gerald Ely says copy inserts tip is a nice one. It's always nicer. I remember it quicker. All right, great, great to see uh, Best Korean Jesus on. Uh, and his question is, hi, Greg, any way to randomize the preset order of Halion or Pad Shop? Okay, so once we're in kind of the media bay here, so let's come over, because sometimes it's really easy to just constantly do the same presets that come at top. So let's say I go to Pad Shop here, um, and we have all these particular sounds. So let me just go to my pad shop library here. So, and these are often completely alphabetical, which is a good way of doing it. But I think if you just click here, um, you could completely shuffle the results. So you get random choices right there from within media bay. And let's see if we could do that within the particular instrument as well. So we'll open this up and we'll go to or choices here and then there is just a shuffle mode right there so you don't always like wow I always pick um you know presets that start with the letters a b or c on this instrument so completely just click right there and reshuffle the results and then it won't always show up and great to see you back on the live stream hope you're well hope you're surviving all the rains in southern california all right, so we have May Myers Family Vlogs USA just saying hi. So thanks for being on the live stream. All right, uh, Darren Flake asks a uh, question, how to pan notes in Very Audio? So there isn't really a panning function inside of Very Audio. Again, like Very Audio, we can think of as primarily, you know, pitch correction. So, you know, it's easy enough to do panning, uh, you know, for the channel on audio, but it's really kind of designed more for pitch correction. So as I come here, you know, we could adjust our pitch um, just that easily to, you know, adjust pitches. So there is, if you go to the lower right-hand corner while you're doing a lot of tuning, you may notice that you have like perhaps consonants or different segments that are a little loud and soft so you can adjust the volume, but there isn't any panning control. Uh, and that's gonna be mo most likely done directly inside of the channel mixer controls. We see Jay has received of Secret Studios, one gallon of amaretto chocolate ice cream for Michael Teams. All right, we see from Vincent, uh, thank you, Greg, for answering my questions and thanks for looking up. Is there a way to remove the group effects with the key? Much appreciation for what you do. Thanks for the kind words, I appreciate it. See, uh, from Mark Raven, who says, Greg, you're doing amazing. I'm not trying to add more work for you. Please don't hear it that way. Just trying to help and gratitude for all you do. So, yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's kind of a, a one-man show for all of the production stuff. I don't have a, a team like, you know, other content producers do to have stuff handle, handy. I'll, I'll see if there's any solution 
Um, you know, I know some people afterwards you could have the text transcribed like while you're answering it. So, you know, if you turn on closed captioning, I think it might only be in English. Um, but you know, so that may be an option is to use the closed captioning when watching it, uh, afterwards. See Garrett just saying, I'm glad we have what we, but we have two Greg. So, yeah. All right, a uh, question from Mohammed Salah. Can you open in separate window, very audio editor? So we could have it go directly into the lower zone editor. And if I want it in a separate window, all you have to do, we'll see this little arrow that's kind of pointing up to the right in the right-hand corner of the editors in the lower zone. So click there, now it's a separate window. If we want to go back to the lower zone, we'll see a little arrow that kind of points down to the left. And that's how you could toggle back and forth between uh, very audio in the lower zone and an editor. Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. All right, we see Jay from Secret Studios has to run. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Razel, wonderful to see you on, uh, from Denmark. His question is, uh, there is a three lines to show that an instrument is VST3 in Cubase 13. Where can I see that instrument is VST2 or VST3? So I think this might be resolved in maybe the, perhaps the next maintenance release. But if you come over here, let's say we add an instrument track, um, and we click here. So you may notice there used to be like little three hash marks. So if you just kind of go uh, click on the bottom area here and slide over to the right, then you can see the three slashes indicating it's a VST3 instrument. So once again, just kind of click there. I know it's used to be always visible in all the windows. I think it'll be resolved perhaps in the next maintenance update, but just kind of look for but it's there, it's just a little off screen. So give that a try if you're confused as to loading up your VST2 or VST3 version of the same plugin. All right, we see Michael Teams has to run. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you on Friday. See X Cubase X on. And Benny says, thanks, Greg, that's what I meant. Glad I hopefully understood. All right, Gareth wants to everyone to remember to smash burger that like. All right, so see from Mohammed Salah in Cubase 12, everything worked great, but in Cubase 13, make me crazy, same setting. So let me know exactly what uh, particular setting is not working for you or not functioning. All right, we see JVI on. And he says, wow, shuffle for instrument presets. Missed that one. Excellent. My revelation of the day. We'll give you that feature free. Everyone that when next time they boot up their Cubase, that function, the shuffle function will be there. All right, Darren Flake asks, question, does recording get affected when recording as linear or musical mode? Does it affect syncing audio with the BPM and tune? Can you explain it? Thanks. So if we record an audio source, um, so during the recording, it doesn't matter if it's audio, it doesn't matter if it's in linear musical mode, that's completely irrelevant. So the program is just capturing. If you are recording with uh, if you're recording with the metronome where you have the tempo activated in the tempo field of the program. So let's come over and I'll just record a new audio track. We're going to call this Darren. 
Okay, so as I record a new audio track here. All right, so we have our new file. And when we go into our pool, so we see our pool is going to show us all the audio files used in the particular project. And we will come over to... to our Darren file here, we'll see that our tempo is 100 beats per minute and that it's automatically recorded at 100 beats per minute. So the tempo is kind of, the file has a tempo metadata on the particular file already. So it extracted that from the tempo that you recorded in Cubase. So if you get files, sometimes they're marked as 120 beats a minute. It could be that the person who recorded the file maybe wasn't recording to a click track in Cubase and they didn't record to the metronome and the file's at 120 beats a minute. So if you have a file that shows 120 beats per minute, it's probably a 50-50 chance that the person didn't record at 120 beats per minute but just didn't record with a click track. So now that this file is recorded at 100 beats a minute, if we place it, I'll just control or command P, if we place it into musical mode and we place it on a track that is set to musical mode or linear, and so musical mode is gonna have this little dot and the event itself is in musical mode, which we could see also from the info line. If I now change the tempo to 120 beats a minute, the file will still play at, will speed up to match the tempo. And that's what the musical mode will show you, will allow you to do. So when I turn off musical mode here, I'll just change this color, so a little easier to read. So when I change my tempo to, when I have this event selected, and then I take it off musical mode, this is at its original length, but now, we're going from 100 beats a minute to 120 beats per minute. That means it's going to speed up. The event is going to get shorter. It's now synced to the new project tempo. So that's what musical mode does. Now you could have tracks that are set to musical mode and some tracks that are set to linear mode. Now why would some people want tracks in linear mode? Let's imagine we were, and we showed this on the last live stream, if we had a visual cue, like I showed on a video that we want, a, we see a cloud kind of rolling through the scene and I wanted a cymbal sound to match up with that specific point in the video. And I don't want the timing of that cymbal to change based on tempo where I want that particular event to be tied, not to the bars and beats, but tied to, we could think of it as tied to the, the actual time. So if we add a ruler track and we set our, we add a ruler track here and we set this to uh, our time in seconds, that as we change the tempo, if the, the event here is set to linear mode, which looks like a clock, this is going to be this won't adjust the position when we adjust the tempo. It's going to stay. Its position is based on setting it to the time value. So if we want that that symbol sound to always appear when the cloud comes, and if I change the tempo of other events, if it's in linear mode, at that point, we that will always be tied to that moment in time, not to the bar and beat position. When it's in musical mode, if I change the tempo, that cymbal sound will be earlier or later, depending if we have a slower or faster tempo. Now, what could be a little confusing is sometimes you could have on audio tracks is that you could have events, some events that are musical mode, so I can say I want this part to be in musical mode, but I don't want this part to be in musical mode, and I want this event to be in musical mode. So even though it's on with audio events, even though it's on a track that's in musical mode, if the event itself is not set 
to musical mode, then we could override those particular settings even on the same track. So musical mode is always going to be tied to the bar and beat position. If you change the tempo, the bar and beat gets moved earlier or later. Musical mode events will follow that. Linear events are tied to the time position and aren't and are not affected by the particular and are not affected by tempo changes. So, and for the recording, it doesn't, you know, have any impact. All right, so we see Val says a uh, question. Since last update, Cubase asked me when starting what version I want to start, Artist or Pro, even if I don't have Artist installed. How do I fix that, please? So it should automatically, so when you buy a copy of Cubase Artist or Cubase Pro, they're the same. Certain functions are activated when it sees that you have a Cubase Pro license. Uh, so, you know, but when you install Cubase Artists and Cubase Pro, you're installing the same thing. The Cubase Pro license basically allows different features to be accessible and turned on. So usually it should see automatically that you have, you know, Cubase Pro, the Cubase Pro license. Uh, the one thing you could try is maybe, you know, if you go into... You know, if it's bothering you, try going into the uh, Steinberg Activation Manager, maybe deactivating the Cubase license and then reactivating the Cubase license. And that may trick it into seeing. But basically, you know, even if you don't have Cubase Artist installed, everyone has Cubase Artist installed. So if you're a pro user, you could hold down like, you know, command or control while starting Cubase Pro and Cubase Artist could start. So make sure that, you, you know, when you're starting it, you're not holding down a modifier key because that could allow you to switch between different versions for testing purposes if needed. All right, so we see um, Ronin Sakal Music. Uh, Hi, Greg. How to create MIDI events from Apache Fast? I know the record function, but it's too long. All right, so when real time is too long for you, uh, let's come over here. I will just... All right, so let's say I have a quick chord track here. All right, so I have a chord track. I'll go to this track and I'm going to, let's go to the project and say, let's, um, chords to MIDI. So I have this, so right now I have a bunch of like whole note chords. And on this particular track, if I have, um, Apache, let me just, just make sure which one. Okay, so let's say we have Apache and I have a preset here. Okay, and I want this to reflect the pattern without having to record it. So all I have to do is go to MIDI and we can choose freeze MIDI modifiers. And now that will automatically take the effect of any of the MIDI insert effects and apply it directly on the event. So go to your MIDI menu to freeze MIDI modifiers that then gets disabled and the result of the arpeggiator is automatically embedded directly into the particular event. All 
All right, so Jazzy Lamel, great to see you on the live stream, says, hey, Greg, greetings. I was working on a project the other day, and I pulled up a template, and when I did that, the record enable disappeared. Can you tell me why that happens? So check to see if, you know, it could be set to, you know, there are different presets. So if you go just, like, right below the track column list, uh, make sure that, you know, if you're set to mixing, that the recording, there's different presets here. You could open up, you know, different presets, but there are for where you could choose different functions, but just at the very bottom of the tracks, right here where it says mixing, change it to simple or standard. And, you know, you may want to see different functions when you're mixing and probably if you're mixing, you're not recording, so you may not need that. So just make sure that you have these set to like standard preset right there and that will probably bring back the record enable and monitor enable okay so we see from uh, suede and tv recording studio where are the tutorials inside and mid chaining please so it could really depend on the plugin. So you'll probably notice that it's going to be a function that's inside of, uh, if we come over here, it'll be inside of like a plugin such as frequency, since that has mid side functionality. So once you come over here, we'll go to frequency. Once you enable, let's say mid side on a couple different parameters and then when you go to side chain so we'll go to uh, the dynamic mode here um, but we could just at that point we could activate kind of the side chain I'll just kind of switch it here so we'll go to our dynamics and then you can see the side chain and each band can have its own internal side chain so each of the eight bands for your mid side on your EQ can have independent side chains for each band, but you probably just need to activate the dynamics and turn on the side chain and tell which side chain input to use. All right, um, so we see from Chaluminate, uh, when I open an existing project, a dialog, uh, resolve missing files appears. I don't want to resolve missing files. So how do I get rid of this? So basically it's telling you that there are files that are missing that, you know, that are referenced in the project. So it's going to do that as a safety measure. If you want to get rid of the message, all you have to do is go to your media once you have that and just choose remove unused media, but that's just telling you that there are files that are referenced in, in the project or referenced in the pool that it cannot find. So, you know, if, if you don't want, you know, so the way to get rid of the message is just to choose remove unused media. All right, you see Gareth has to take off. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see a um, question um, from Ronin Sekol Music. How can I see a history of volume or pan changes in the inspector? There is no undo function after changing the volume there. All right, so let's say I come over, I have this particular track, I adjust the volume, I adjust the pan, I adjust the volume, I adjust the pan. So try holding down Alt or Option plus Z. So this actually goes directly into the mix console history since we're looking at the mix console here. Um, so as we just, we see a dedicated mix console history that's separate and unique from the edit history. So this way we could undo, go back or redo. So, but you could also hold down alt or option plus Z or alt or option plus shift plus Z to redo mixer functions. If you're in the full screen mixer, 
you could actually see the edit history right here listed out for you. So it is a separate uh, separate undo history. So, but that should work for you. All right, so we see Jay asks, um, can the project logical editor simply move events to pre-existing folders based on target name, i.e. snare top and snare bottom into snare folder? So currently there isn't a function in the project logical editor to move events. We could move it to be routed to particular groups. We could change the inputs to outputs, but there isn't any functionality in the logical editor to actually change or to move contents to a particular folder. So it has to be done manually. All right, we see John Barry had to take off. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're well. All right, let's go ahead to, we had a bunch of questions sent in. So let's get to those. And again, you could always send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, so let me just revert this and then. All right, so the first question we had, and this is probably a carryover from last live stream, it was about doing kind of guitar strumming effects in Cubase. So let's say if we have a file that just has some basic block chords. Just. I'll just revert this quickly. Great, so let me just look at this. Just load up a different instrument here real quick. So let's say we have just some block chords. And so what I'm going to do is just load up um, a MIDI plugin and we'll just load up Apache SX, right? And then there's a whole sequencer section. And let's get to factory presets and let's get to guitar. So let's say I just want to do acoustic guitar lounge. So now that we have just chords laid out for us here, So without having to really do anything, we could just load up these arpeggiators. So 
there's all sorts of great presets that you could use. So, you know, we just have kind of block chords laid out for us here. And just like what we showed earlier is that we could come over here and just choose the freeze MIDI modifiers. And these can all be just uh, created right there. So, but again, just check out, you know, some of the different arpeggios. So instead of like just different strums at this point, we can just kind of turn these on. Some of these are obviously for kind of electric guitar, but don't let that. So check out, you know, some of the built-in factory presets that are kind of designed specifically for guitar in the Arpache SX. So again, just come over here. You want to go to the sequencer section and then you could have all sorts of great different guitar. Arpeggios. All right, uh, so question, can you show some automation functions using the range tool? Okay, so let's come over. All right, so I'll make this really large. And I want to, let's say we have some existing automation in here. So first off, if I just have my range tool selected and if I want to do like an automation bump, I could just come here, let's say I select this range, I want to increase. We could also choose to, if I have a range selected in automation, uh, some of the other points, we could just do straight kind of curves here. So if I wanted this to curve up, we could also just kind of take these particular points and be able to adjust our curves accordingly. If we have existing automation events, I could select these events here. I could bring them all up or down. I could also tilt. If I wanted to tilt while holding down Alt or Option, we could keep the center point the same. So I could tilt the beginning curve, if I go to the edge, I could compress or expand the automation if I want to keep that automation centered, uh, but still expand, we could just hold down the Alt or Option key. So without the Alt or Option key or with. So there's all sorts of great automation functions that you could just do. So you say, okay, this is too loud there. Um, I want this. I want to do a little bump here in this phrase. I want to take that down. I want to take this whole range here and let's say duplicate it. So I just hit command or D and I could just duplicate that particular range of automation as well. So lots of great stuff that you could do with automation. All right, so question, can you show output routing presets in Groove Agent? All right, so let's say we have Beat Agent and I have a lot of different kits that are playing and we see that when we go to, let's say our pattern here. And we go look at our mixer, we can see that these are all kind of broken out so that if we go to the instrument, so and we could do this different ways. So on our beat agent kit, when we select the pad, I could just come over and we can see this is output three. I can set this and we have 32 stereo outs. So each of these is going to different outputs. So we could choose to lock the outputs. So if I'm playing this particular pattern, 
and I wanted to load different pattern groups or different kits, I could just say, okay, let's come over here. And now all the outputs are maintained. Now, if we're dealing with an acoustic agent kit, what we could do, so let's say we go to our acoustic agent and we look at the mixer here. And these are routed to different outputs. So output three, four. So let's say I had these all set to the master output. Once we have kind of an output routing that we like, all we have to do is save the output right here. So I could say I saved one as a multi out and then I could just recall that and now these are all going to be routed to multiple outputs right there. So if we come over so that's all you have to do is just simply save it as once you have it all configured come over here and save it as a multi out all right all right so we see um how to record the output of midi plugins okay so let's say we'll go back to our guitar and I'll just load up a different arpeggiator preset here. So if we want to do this in real time, instead of using the function, uh, we see this little line here and I move this line down and then as I hit record, So now what we've done instead of recording just block chords, which is what I played, we've now captured all of the arpeggios from the actual plugin itself. And if you have a plugin that is uh, outputs MIDI, like there's lots of VST instrument plugins and other plugins that output MIDI. Uh, so let's say if I go to my acoustic agent here and we'll open this up and I wanted to capture the MIDI from the plugin. You could also just pop over here and I'll set the MIDI input. Instead of all MIDI inputs, we'll say, let's send it from the, we'll see under plugins and then we'll see the acoustic agent. So now as I hit record here and I'll just, And now what uh, the patterns I just triggered were now recorded directly in internally into Cubase. So there's my patterns that I just triggered. So again, you could have the MIDI input or if you have uh, the plugin outputs MIDI, you can set that as a MIDI input in Cubase 13. This has been kind of reorganized so that you could see exactly the plugins that's coming from if you want MIDI inserts uh, to be recorded. All you have to do is just simply come over here, move this line down. Anything above the line will be recorded. Anything below will just be on playback.
All right. Uh, so we have a question. What's a good technique to fatten up drums? One of my favorite uh, go-to plugins has always been the envelope shaper for this. So let's come over here. So I have these drums and I want to fatten them up. So I sent these all to a group. And even if we go to like our channel settings here, we'll go to the channel strip. Under tools, you'll see envelope shaper as part of the channel. And let's say I just want to, we could adjust our attack and our release and our overall output. So without, with, so you could run it on every channel as a channel strip or again, run it as an insert. So if we go to dynamics, you'll see the envelope shaper here, same algorithm. And if you wanted to run that in kind of a multi-band format, if you just go to again to dynamics, you could now have a multi-band envelope shaper where you could have different uh, transient control over multiple frequency ranges right there. All right, so we had a question um, some weeks ago. I asked you about syncing Cubase Pro to LTC from a tape machine. I found a little Mac OS utility that converts LTC to, MIDI, to MTC, so that's longitudinal longitudinal time code to MIDI time code. Unfortunately, I have yet to find an analog tape machine uh, to test it with, but uh, it says these settings will work. Uh, so, and also he said it would be interesting to hear if any other club member has experience with this. So generally when you're gonna be synchronizing to external tape, you know, you'll need to get the time code from the tape. So generally the time codes are going to be recorded on an audio track of tape. It's often the last track because it can often bleed. So it could be like if you're a 16 track deck, probably be on track 16 or like a two inch 24 track, be on track 24. And that output of the time code is going to be fed into a hardware device. That hardware device that will then convert the incoming time code, whether it's SMPTE or LTC, Vitzy, whatever time code it is, uh, and convert that to MIDI time code that the computer can synchronize. Now that sync box will also take the word clock, and it will re it will resolve the clock from the synchronizer to your audio interface. So you'll need to have a way of getting digital clock. Whether it's most people would use a BNC word clock. Uh, you could also use ADAT or AES or SPDIF for the clock source so that the two clocks are resolving. So generally, I don't think that a piece of software that converts the MIDI timecode to, uh, to or LTC to MTC is going to help. You still have to get that timecode. And if you have, you know, other, if it's not important to, you know, if you're just capturing, doing a transfer, and there's no other sequence that's involved, you know, you can capture that quite easily without being synchronized. But if you want it to have the same time code position, if you're synchronizing older MIDI sequences, you will need a piece of hardware. Now, instead of thinking of purchasing an expensive piece of hardware for this task, most places where you have a, a tape machine, this is very common, will take the, you know, most tape machines will have a sync box because they've had to sync to automation on a console. They've had to sync to other tape machines, to computers for, you know, 40 plus years. So it's pretty common that if someone has a tape machine that you're doing the transfers from, that they would have a sync box. So I would consider that. I don't think that the utility to go from, uh, LTC to MTC will be of much use. All right, so we had a question. Can you explain what the different zoom settings and functions are in the sample editor? So if you're looking at the sample editor, uh, let's say I double click on this event here. Let me just hide my regions here. 
All right, there's three different modes. So we have a global zoom. We see a clip-based zoom and auto zoom to event. So let's say our, I think by default, it's set to global zoom. So if we are here, um, I could see, so we'll set this to global zoom. Let me just. Oh, sorry, let me just take this out of. I'll just revert this real quick here. All right, so when we have global zoom, we could see all of the material, all of the time before and after the event starts here. So we can see that we have measures. This event starts at measure 28 and goes through measure 33. So we see the event there. But if I want it set to clip-based zoom, I can only see the contents for that particular clip. So as I zoom in, I can't see measures, you know, outside of the event parameters. But if I go to global zoom, now when I zoom in, we see that that is just a small portion of time, but maybe I just want to edit what is there. So I'm gonna do only the clip base so I know exactly what I'm looking at. So if I've zoomed in here, let's say if I have a longer audio file, we may want to have auto zoom to event so that I could see the entire event here. So that way I could quickly, you know, see global zoom will show me all of the time. The clip based zoom will restrict so that I could only zoom in with these particular events. And if I quickly wanted to see the entire event, I would just choose to auto zoom the event. So that's what the three different modes will allow you to do. All right, question. Can you also show us how to create our own MIDI pad for chord pads? Okay, so <clears throat> let me clear my throat. All right, excuse me. All right, so I'm just gonna pop over here. All you have to do to make your own chord pads, and this is changed slightly in Cubase uh, 13, but we'll just show a little bit. All right, so if I have my chord pads activated here, we see where it says playing chords. All you'd have to do is just drag a MIDI event from the project window right to there and now we could just trigger the particular chord pads right there so so just again drag and drop right to the chord pad editor All right, uh, question. I have 10 audio tracks and I want to play back in binaural, stereo, mono, 7.1 speaker playback. How do I do that? Okay, so let's say we want to jump over. Let's see if this is. All right, so let's say we want to do binaural first. So I'm gonna come over to my audio connections and I want to make sure one that we have a binaural output. So I just did a second order ambisonics here. Um, now we could also, um, so if we wanted to listen to that, so let's say now I want to take uh, all of these tracks and are all routed to a group. I'm gonna go to my inspector on my group and we're going to route this to my binaural output. 
when I go into my connection, I'm going to go to my audio connections and we want to right click and choose uh, binaural as our main mix output. So now that we have that done, all right, so let's say I want to take uh, my snare hit here. Okay, so I will we'll just take this and I'll go to my, my group since my group is now routed to the binaural. So I'll just select this and So now we could just kind of come over here and on our, let's say our, by our, let's say our ambisonic output at this point, we could just put a, our ambient decoder plugin. And this would allow us to on stereo headphones to hear this kind of panning around in ambisonics. Now, if we're doing this for, uh, like, let's say 714. Now, if it is set up for a, uh, a project, let's say we're at, let me just check my sample rate here. All right, so we're 48K. Another, if you want to do this for working with Dolby Atmos, all you'd have to do is, I'm going to check my buffer size. Okay, so I have the right buffer size for the audio interface. Then if you go to, if it's more, less ambisonics, but more Atmos, and you wanted to monitor that, we would go to the project window and go to the ADM authoring, go to our setup assistant. We could add all of our beds, our main mix to that. And now that we're here, we can see our down mix. And at this point we could choose to monitor in binaural if you have just headphones that you're working with or we could do 714 514 512 7151 stereo binaural so you could do your different mixing right there now if it's set up as a like a dedicated 714 output so, and we want to then do down mix monitoring of that, not necessarily ambisonics or binaural. Let's say these are all being routed out to our 714 out. So I will hold down uh, Alt or Option plus Shift. Now all these tracks are going to our 714 out. I'll go into my audio connections. We'll set our 714 out as our main mix. And we'll go into our control room. I will remove one monitor. I'll just remove these. So I'm going to right click, let's add monitor. We have four available. I want this to be 714. I hit okay. So now we have this. Um, when we go into our control room, we can see our down mix presets. So now at this point we could say, I want to go from 714 to 51 to stereo to mono. So we could do your different down mix presets right there from within the control room, which is very handy. All right, next question. Um, I am planning to upgrade from Cubase Pro 12 to Cubase Pro 13. I also noticed that Cubase will install a new software rather than upgrade the existing one to, into a new one. I'm thus concerned that all of my settings for plug-in chains and also the VST menu that I have customized will be a pain to recreate in this new installation. Is there a way to export settings from Cubase 12 to Cubase 13 or will the new install pick it up? Thanks a lot for your help. 
So the new version will automatically, like those settings are kind of always stored in kind of a different area of the program that's not actually part of the program files for Cubase. You know, if you look in the program files, so it's always going to be stored either in the preferences folder in Mac OS or in your application data folder on Windows 10 and 11 so that those settings will be automatically picked up for you so you don't have to worry about it. Question. Uh, hello, Greg. Uh, hope you can help. I've asked in several groups with no reply. Having set quick controls to CC1 Dynamics and CC11 Expression in Musio, both are reacting in Musio when moving the faders on external controller but is not registered, recorded in Cubase automation tracks. Okay, so we just set up, uh, let me fix my control room here real quick. Okay, so when you're working with, um, all right, so when you're working with quick control, so if you want to actually record the particular controllers, let me just set up one of my controllers to do this quickly. A second, let me just get this. Okay, so what I think, sorry, I just, uh, so what I think you're doing, so, you know, you probably, if you're doing quick controls with your faders, let me just set this up uh, to do quick control. So I'll come over here to my MIDI remote and I have this set for quick controls. So I have focus quick control. So if I go to a particular instrument here that we could have those that particular instrument automatically respond to the quick controls that we are doing right here. So, so when we have quick controls, we could think of the CC number as showing, as we're using this CC number when we've learned that we're, you know, saying this fader, whether it's CC1 or CC11, is controlling the quick controls. All right, now the quick controls may not be what you're actually need to do. And we think of the quick controls as we're taking that MIDI CC message that's then controlling and it's saying, okay, MIDI CC one, when we go to a particular plugin, will automatically control these parameters. So let's open up just a quick, uh, I'll just do a quick insert here and say we go to my distortion, let's go to the VST amp rack. We open this up and we can see that the quick controls are controlling various parameters right here. So as we adjust our quick controls. So this is the MIDI CC message is the, when utilizing it as a quick control is saying this CC message is kind of what sentence needs to be, what message needs to be to control this parameter. So if you are using it for doing straight, you know, MIDI CC11, MIDI CC1, 
don't don't route it through a quick control because the quick control is kind of saying we're taking those messages to control the particular plugin. We're not taking those to record them as MIDI CC information. So you probably don't want to have it installed as quick controls and you just want to record it as MIDI. So when you record it as MIDI, so let's say if I'm over here and I have, I'll just record some MIDI with modulation in it. So I'll just record some chords. I'll move my mod wheel. So now when I could see that I have my chords and then when we go to our MIDI CC data, it's going to be recorded inside of the part. So it doesn't necessarily show up as automation. By default, it's a MIDI continuous controller message that's going to be captured in a part. So you can see MIDI CC1. If you wanted to add, uh, you know, CC11 here, they would by default just simply show up in the event itself so that we could see everything here in the MIDI. So I move the events and all this event contains the MIDI notes plus the MIDI CC data. So you don't need to assign it as quick controls if you want to control the dynamics of your instrument. Just record it as MIDI. Um, and if you need to see it as automation uh, as opposed to MIDI CC data, uh, at this point you go to your CC automation setup and then you could choose by default to send it to an automation track then it will show up as automation so sometimes people will look at their automation as being so right now we could see the modulation show up as an automation track or we could see it show up you know as within MIDI data so but by default it's just straight MIDI data don't use a quick control the quick control is taking that MIDI CC message and controlling a different parameter where if you want to control the dynamics simply don't send that through a quick control just record the actual MIDI CC data on to the events themselves All right, um, so question, would you be so kind as requested to team add an option to render groups as easily as audio tracks so there's no need to, for workarounds such as one in a form? Thank you for the consideration. So, you know, when rendering groups, you know, the one thing that you have to remember when we go to render a, a particular event, you know, so let's say I have all of my drums here going through, um, going through a group you know so there's no actual data on a group so a couple ways to render this very fast is just to come over add an audio track and let's say we have you know this is our drum group so we'll say drums you know one is a couple of different approaches one is just to come over here add an audio track and set its input from our drum group and just hit record and so that's good if you're doing like seven or eight different groups at once you could just hit play and it will record the output of the group directly in or you could choose to come over and just do your export audio mix down and just say okay i want to take all of my go to multiple select all your group channels and export and we'll just say create audio track so we'll say export audio it will now export and create your group tracks just like that so you know so since there is no actual event on a group you know you could record it or export it and that's why it's just not as easily rendered because there's actually nothing there it's just kind of a conduit for sound to be processed All right, so we had a question. Um, how do you select 
every second MIDI note. For example, I want to select every second kick drum C0 and lower the velocity and bring it up to snare D0. Okay, so let's take a look. We can do this in the logical editor. So let me just jump to a different project here quick. Okay, so let's say we have, um, I want to take something, a pattern that we have here, and I want to select, let's say, every hi-hat or every other kick drum. So let's say we have kicks laid out for us here. I want to select every other kick drum in this pattern. So what we do is let's go to your logical editor. So we'll go to the MIDI logical editor. Let's remove this and we want to transform we'll say we want to say type is equal to note uh, we will come here to last event I think and we'll choose every other event and we'll say event counter and we'll say two so now if I look at my part that I have selected here um, and let's say we want to do it on a specific pitch. So I'll insert and we'll say uh, our subtype is equal to is equal to C1. So let me just select these first here. So now you can see that every other C1 is selected. Now, if we choose transform, let's say I just want to make this super clean. So I'll put just four and a floor quarter notes here. Okay, so I want to I want to take every other one of those notes and decrease or increase the velocity. So now I'm going to choose transform. We will go to insert. I'll say let's go to velocity, and we want to add uh, or let's subtract a value of 20. So now every other kick drum is decreased in velocity by value of 20. So that's how you can uh, set that up right there. So again, you want to type is equal to note. You want to choose our subtype, which will be pitch is equal to choose the pitch right there. And we'll say last event, every other event, event counter. So if you want to select every third note, every fourth note, you would put a three or four. If you want every other note, select a two. And then what do you want to do with it? So we could also say, I want to come over and I want to take the uh, the type of note and let's set to, uh, we could set it to a fixed value and then we could say our subtype or we'll just choose subtype here, pitch. And we want, we could say, let's add two and now that we remove I could just say every other high every other note uh, turn it from C1 into D1 and so you could create project or MIDI logical editor presets all right so we have a question um, how can I stop media bay from importing key information from audio MIDI uh, is there a setting inside of Media Bay? So, you know, if you look at Media Bay, so, you know, if the med if the metadata is in there, you know, we had discussions of people weren't seeing metadata, but you could just, you know, the metadata could be transferred over automatically. You could override the metadata. I, I'm not sure, you know, if you would want to do that. Uh, you know, if you want to use it in a, in a scenario, but if you don't want to see the key or, you know, you could just choose again, which particular fields are active. So if you go to uh, like musical properties, you could 
come over here, you'll see the project root key. You could choose not to see that, but the metadata will probably still be embedded within the particular file. Question, um, is there a way to zoom in and out of Cubase by just using the trackpad MacBook Pro? So I don't have my trackpad open, but I will see if I get an answer for that on Friday. Sorry, didn't get a chance to do that. Um, question, is there a gain reduction plug plugin or tool I can use the Cubase to turn down gain without using the faders, kind of like Waves L2? So, you know, you could always just uh, on every single track, if you come over to the pre section, you have a gain control. So let's say we just come right over here. Um, you could adjust, you know, how much gain is actually set uh, just directly here. So you have high cut, low cut filter, but anytime that you look at the channel, you could adjust. So if I come here, we could see the volume control that you could adjust without pulling up the fader. If you open up the channel settings, you can come right over here to the channel EQ and you could adjust the gain right here as well. All right, so we have a question on how to use drum flams in Cubase. So let's say if I wanted to come over here uh, one of the things that you could do very easily is using just kind of the MIDI plugin. So let's get to your MIDI insert. And if you go to like a beat designer plugin, so I could just come over, let's say I just want to put in kick and snare. So I'll just solo this track here. So if you just kind of click here, uh, let me just undo that. But you could just click on the bottom here and add flams onto the particular snare sounds right there. So you could do that inside a beat designer. And then if you wanted to drag that pattern over, you could just drag the beat designer pattern right over. All right, so I think we're out of questions and I think we're just about out of time. So let me just check see if there's anything that's earth shattering on the next uh, on the page. So with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, we will be doing this again on Friday, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. If you have questions that you want to send in advance, send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Thanks for all the wonderful questions from everyone. I hope everyone's learned a new tip or trick. And I appreciate you taking time out of your day to watch the Club Cubase live stream and to learn more about Steinberg products. And we hope to see more of you back on future live streams. And with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you back on Friday. Take care.